that sequence which you meet again and again in the suttas, because you meet it again and again and again, it gives it more authority, it makes it more unlikely it could have been some mistake or could have been added by some somebody or something. That the only way to be sure that it's Jataputi Yana Dasana is first of all it's based on the experience after jhanas. And the only way you can be sure that the five hindrances are abandoned is that you've experienced that jhana and now you've come out. So often we have this uh, word called upachara samadhi and people quite rightly take that to be sufficient to arouse reliable insight. And the upachara samadhi is defined quite rightly too as the absence of the five hindrances but not in jhanas. And the point is that nobody really knows what upachara samadhi is unless you've gone into those jhanas. You only know the entrance to a house by knowing the house which lies next to it. Otherwise you may take anything to be the entrance, even though the house is many miles and miles away. The neighbourhood can only be known by what it's next to. So I'm afraid that many monks even, they're good meditators but they don't go deep enough and they get to a stage and they think that what arises in that stage is insight and can be relied upon. It would be much better if they kept on going deeper and deeper and go through the upachara samadhi which is before jhanas and into those jhanas so that their mind can experience the bliss of those states and they would know for sure that this is a jhana. And when they come out afterwards, they will know that this state after jhana is what is meant by upachara. And you know that the five hindrances are absent. You'll understand what that means. You'll understand just how deep those five hindrances are. That's why that sometimes you read in the books that the first hindrances is sensory desire. What does that mean? Does it mean like just lust or thinking about food? A lot of the time, most of the monks in this monastery aren't thinking about lust or thinking about food, but they've still got sensory desire, first hindrance, present. You don't realise just how deep those hindrances go, the subtle forms of those hindrances. They're still working, just right up through even the nimitta stage of meditation. And it takes a lot of courage, a lot of letting go, a lot of resolution to keep on going enough to go through those five hindrances into jhanas. When you come out afterwards, then you'll know for sure just what those five hindrances are and what it's like when they're not there. And that's the stage where at least you know the samadhi has happened, the five hindrances are temporally not there. It's a place where insight can happen. And if insight happens there, at least you can tick it off. The first criteria is insight born of a mind which has just emerged from samadhi. Samadhi pachaya. That could be yata bhuti yana dasana. It could be seeing things as they truly are. Awija has been weakened there. However, even just after a jhana, you may not see things as they truly are. Here you've got to check it with the, the Buddhist suttas to see whether what you see there is in accordance with what the Buddha said and what all the arahats for the past 25 centuries have referred to as the authoritative teachings. One of the reasons we can trust the suttas and the vinaya is because anyone who sees that dharma will look back upon those recorded teachings and just to say, that is what I've seen. As the Buddha said, no different. So those two criteria there is where you can find out what insight is. 
it also means that what appears outside of that can be useful, can be helpful, you can't really trust it. The vipalazas can still be active. The vipalazas because of views, perceptions, thoughts, making more views, bending perceptions. And it's incredible just how powerful that can be. With those views, wrong views, not seeing clearly, comes up the (coughs) defilements of desire and aversion. So often when we are not in a state of, of upachara, when the mind hasn't developed samadhi, you can see just how much likes and dislikes affect perceptions and thoughts. We only perceive what we want to perceive. When we don't perceive what we don't like to perceive. There have been many experiments done in psychology on this point. One which comes to mind It was an experiment done in Harvard University a few years ago where the experimenters were showing a group of volunteer students images flashed on a screen. They had a notepad next to them to describe what they saw. At first the images were flashed up so quickly they could make no sense out of what was shown. It was just too fast to register a coherent image on the retina and to be made sense of by the mind. Little by little, by small increments, the experimenters lengthened the exposure on the screen of these images from a thousandth of a second to a few hundredths of a second to a few tenths of a second more and more and more, until the students could think they understood what the image was. And they kept on extending the exposure to one second, two seconds, three seconds, until they'd find out exactly what their image was and to check it with their first impressions. So often their first impressions were wrong. Perception jumped to a conclusion I remember the report about this. They gave the example that one of the images which they flashed on the screen was of the steps to a well-known building in Harvard, which every student would recognize. However, it was flashed so fast that one student couldn't recognize it at first. And then it was flashed a bit longer, a bit longer. And then he thought it was a sailing ship. Once that perception was in his mind, as the length of exposure was increased, that perception remained. Even to a point where an ordinary person, the exposure would have been enough for them to see quite clearly it was a building at Harvard. He continued to look at it, to see it as a ship. The initial perception had created a view And that view was still strong enough to bend reality. And so even when it was a couple of seconds long, the sort of exposure which anyone would see was a building, not a ship. He was still seeing it as a ship. It was a very good example of the whippalasas. But he also said the image which took the longest for people to recognize in this experiment the one which their mind continued to reject was something which was disgusting to the students. The image was just two dogs copulating. And they couldn't see that for a long time. You know why? Because the mind didn't want to see it. So often, likes and dislikes or fixed views I'm sure it's a ship, makes us see the thing as a ship. We don't like to see this. 
two dogs copulating. So we just don't see it. The image has to be right in our face, long periods of time. And then finally we admit, yes, we were wrong. And it is something I didn't want to see. It's basic psychology, but it's also part of Buddhist Dhamma, the Vipalazas. And so how is it that we can be sure that what we're actually perceiving, what we're thinking, what our views, how can we be sure that they are right? Are all views got the same value? And the answer is no, there is such a thing as right view and there is such a thing as wrong view. And the only way we can know it's right view is to make sure the five hindrances are gone so that which bends perception and bends thought and bends view, likes and dislikes, are all eliminated. It's as if, after a jhana, you don't care whether it's dogs copulating, whether it's a boat, whether it's a building. You've just got no vested interest in what you see. You've got no axe to grind, no view to protect, especially no person to protect. You need to get that sense of freedom of inquiry to be able to break through awija. So often we think that our mind is free. We're free thinkers, we can th- think what we like. But so often we're not free. That we are imprisoned by our views. We're imprisoned by our likes and dislikes. And they do not permit us to see anything which challenges our likes and dislikes. You all know about dogmatic religion. Why is some religion, or some philosophies, or even in science, why are some scientists so dogmatic that they're right and everyone else is wrong? The reason is because (coughs) they're in prison. Their views, their likes and dislikes, prevent them from seeing the other person's viewpoint or to see something other than what they want to see. They can't see what they don't like to see. So for us, we should always reflect upon that to make sure that we don't trust our views if we haven't gained jhana. To don't trust our perceptions, our thoughts, if the five hindrances are still working. You can't trust any of that. You might look at someone, you might think that's a beautiful girl. That perception has been bent. Why is it people like to get into lust? Because it gives you a sense of being someone. It gives you something to do. It takes you away from the initial from the underlying suffering of existence. You're doing something. You're escaping. There's a sense of happiness and pleasure there. And so perception decides, or rather the farmers change perception, just to give you a little bit of a buzz for a few minutes. It's been bent. It's not true. Or why you get into ill will and anger against somebody? Why do you do that? Because you want to. Perception has been bent by your likes and dislikes, your wants. So we have to be very careful not to trust that. So if ever you get angry to anyone, anywhere in this world, don't trust that. If anywhere you really like somebody, anywhere in this world, don't trust that. Perception has been bent. It's not truthful.